Thank you, Jennifer. Appreciate that very much. You guys okay? I didn't know you were having this. I would have been over here earlier if you had the free pizza over there. Now, Jen, where are those beef tips you promised me? You promised me beef tips, no pizza, Jen. I gotta talk to Dr. Flowers about that, huh? <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to talk to you all, and uh, I guess I'm the last one in the series this year. Okay, well, I'll try to. What I'll try to do today is show you a lot of pictures. You're probably sick of studying at this point in your life. All that graduate stuff, all the taking of the, the preliminary exams, the comps, and all that. So I just have a lot of pictures to show you. I've got to tell you why I'm a scientist. I mean, we all go into what we are, what we do, because of a passion that we have for it. And I hope you'll see some of the passion I still have in this. I, I was one of the lucky ones. I knew what I wanted to do in eighth grade, and it's what I'm doing now. But I know that's really unusual. People struggle with this decision all your life. So let me take you through my 30 slides so you can kind of count down when I'm getting to the end here. And uh, I got a little story to tell you about us, about us physicists. So that's why I've entitled this, Are We Like Children? I get that question a lot. I get on the planes, I open up my briefcase, there's my business card there that says physics. And there's been like three generations of people who will ask me the question, the person in the seat beside me. People over 50 will say, well, are you like that guy, Dr. Spock, or Mr. Spock on the old Star Trek shows? So if you're above 50, you'll ask me that question. People in the middle say, well, look, I watch that show Mythbusters. Are you like those Mythbuster guys on uh, that show? I said, yeah, we are. And the latest one I've been asking about, are you like Sheldon? Are you like these guys on the Big Bang Theory, that television program on today? So. I'll let you decide at the end of this. Am I, am I like Sheldon, or am I not like Sheldon? <laughs> so, uh, so that's what we're going to have here. Now, I am, I'm also the advisor for the undergraduates in physics. And I always try to give them accurate data on, do you want to become a physicist or not? And there's good and bad to that story. So I'm going to take the idealism where students will come in and say, oh, I love physics, I want to be a physicist, what does it take to do that? And then I have to give them the other side of the story, the realism, because there's idealism and realism, realism plugged into this equation. If you look at, this is a, a piece of data from my global national organization, the American Institute of Physics, you ask the question, how many of us are there in America? How many physicists does the whole United States, every university that produces a PhD level program in physics, how many of us, how many of us are there? About a thousand. That's not very many. So the whole country only produces roughly a thousand physicists per year, at least at a PhD level. <clears throat> so this is the data from 2009 and 2010 combined, and 1,550 doctors 1,300 remain in the USA, and then there's a dividing line. 60% 60 of, 60 of us do postdocs. 29% of us get potentially permanent positions. I like that word they're using, potentially permanent. We all want them to be permanent, permanent positions. And then there's some other temporary positions. So about, there's about 1,000 of us produced to you. That's why you don't meet many of us around. That's why when somebody sees me on a plane, and they see the card, you know, PhD physics, they'll start asking me questions right away. Are you for real? Can I touch you? Uh, are they going to send you to the Smithsonian after you retire? You know, things like that, you know. Are you like Sheldon? So if you figure this out, you just divide 1,000 into 320 million people in the country right now. Uh, for those of you that know scientific notation, I know there's some liberal arts students here, you might not but 3.13 times 10 to the minus 6 is 3 over a million. So there's roughly 3, three people out of a million that are, are, are physicists that you'll meet. Now you say, well, how much is a million people? <laughs> well, take Jordan Hare Stadium. On a good day, that holds roughly 100,000 people watching our football program. Take 10 of those stadiums, pick out three, that's the chances that you're going to meet one of me. So this is a very rare, mysterious breed, I call us. <laughs> Not many of us are produced. 
And <clears throat> I've got a slide coming up that sort of divides physics into subgroupings. You might have, on the average year, only two or three or four people graduating in a certain highly kind of specialized branch of physics. <clears throat> And you ask yourself, is this good or bad for a job? The answer is, it's good or bad for finding a job. Uh, I'll go over that a little bit more later. So we're pretty rare. The Sheldons of the world, the Big Bang Theory, with all these science geeky guys around the table, that's pretty rare to find that. You've got to go to places like you know, national laboratories, uh, et cetera. All right, Jennifer, I told you a little bit about my background, but let me highlight a couple things. Uh, I have a fairly typical background, except I have to have a, a, a second master's degree that you'll see up there that's a little unusual. But uh, I got my, <clears throat> I started on astrophysics. That was my initial goal in life. I wanted to be an astronomer. So I did get my degree in astrophysics, bachelor's degree. Take a guess at how many astrophysicists the country produces in one year. Less than 30. So I was one of 30 people, in a sense. Well, if I would have got a doctorate from astrophysics, getting a degree in that. Uh, I stayed at Michigan State for a master's degree. That was more or less in nuclear physics. And they have a huge lab up there that I was right at the start of as a student, the National Superconducting Cyclotron Lab. That lab finally has overcome MIT as the top nuclear physics program in the country. So Michigan State, not at MIT. Uh, it took 10 years to get there as far as entrenched value systems and what people think about nuclear physics in the Ivy League. Uh, I did this degree in theology. I'll have a slide on that a little bit later. You say, what do I do with that? Well, on a bad day, I go around and bless my instruments, say prayers over them, that they still are working at the end of my day. If you guys, if you guys are in science or engineering, you know, experimental equipment never wants to work the way you like it to. It's always breaking down. Half of my time is spent fixing things. Nature hates to give up her secrets. You've got to work real hard to discover a new thing about, about uh, nature. Then I went out to the University of Oregon, or Oregon Health Sciences University. I got my PhD there and basically applied physics, surface physics is my sub area. Then I went out and did a postdoc. Now, a lot of you maybe don't know what a postdoc is. To get a job in physics, at the level we're at right here, the Big Ten, Pac-10, SEC, uh, Ivy League, Big East level, you have to do a postdoc or you won't even get looked at for these jobs. Unfortunately for us, those of you that are engineering, you have a little less rigorous, uh, I work with a lot of engineers. In fact, I'm with the center cave, we call it the center of uh, advanced vehicle and extreme environmental electronics. I work with a lot of engineering professors. Some of these students in the audience I've worked with uh, you're lucky you don't have to be a postdoc to get these academic positions. A lot of you are going to go to industry anyway, but physics it takes a little bit more. You've got to go do a postdoc for a couple of years. And my philosophy that I tell my students when they're doing a postdoc, you want to pick out the most famous person in your field, your subfield, and you want to write and beg and plead, uh, have your mother call this person and beg to get a job as a postdoc. Because once you're linked up with a famous person, your life is, is really good. Because okay? my name is on a piece of paper with the guy I did my postdoc with. Probably if there was a Nobel Prize in surface chemistry, he would have been on the short list. And he basically got me this job here. Okay? I got a call at Intel Corporation where I was working at the time saying, well, Auburn has this opening. Would you be interested? We just talked to your old uh, PhD, or your postdoc mentor. He said he'd be good for the job. I said, look, I'm already making good money out here, you guys. I mean, why don't I go to Alabama? So, <laughs> so there was this big question. Do I stay in Silicon Valley, California, you know, land of Gucci's and Poochies, or do I move to Redneck City, Alabama? Kind of thing, at least I thought. So a big decision there. Uh, then I worked in industry for a while. Uh, I worked in industry a company called Intel. They make all the brains of your computers that you guys are using today. It was fun to be in Silicon Valley at that time because you really were at the beginning. I won't tell you how old I am, but I was kind of in the beginning of the start of Intel. I started a lot of the semiconductors in Silicon Valley. Steve Jobs, uh, Bill Gates, they were all out there at that time. It was a wild place. You were working 24 hours a day because there was a lot of money to be made in those days. 
And I worked on a microprocessor that was a pre-Pentium. You guys have Pentiums in your computers. They used to be called the 486 and the 386, and I was, I was in Intel during the 486 days. So the brains of your computer, uh, I worked with the original scientists involved in that. Now, you can see my, my background is very hybrid. I got my degrees in physics, but then I did a postdoc under a chemist. Worked in the chemistry department, this, this is all I was talking about. Then, at Intel, I was with material science group. So, and you need all of that to do what I do today. In fact, it's helped me enormously to have this hybrid background, not just to be in my little area of physics, you know, but to say, okay, I need to know some materials, I need to know some chemistry, I need to know some electrical engineering, and my job in life has forced me to keep learning all the time. And so I'm fortunate that I have this kind of a background in life. Let me tell you about the 10 major areas of physics in case some of you, you know, most people hate physics. Uh, <laughs> I know why pretty much, but uh, uh, I, I love it myself. There's 10 areas. And there's about 35 different sub-areas mixed in these 10 areas. And so some of us do quantum physics, some of us do particle physics, molecular condensed matter, that's sort of the sub-area I'm in. Astrophysics, I was in that for my bachelor's degree work. So I kind of went from astrophysics, nuclear physics, condensed matter physics, surface physics. Uh, I'm kind of then this hybrid uh, materials, electrical engineering, chemistry, that sort of deal. Now again, think of the, there's only a thousand of us produced a year. So you got a thousand people that are, are basically distributed over 33 areas. That's not many people per area. We're really rare people. When we go to conferences, especially in the newer areas of physics, there might only be like 30 people there. Because <laughs> that's the only, that's, that's the total amount of people interested in a particular area. Now, let me tell you about AE physics, because this is why Jennifer had me. Uh, I showed her through some of my our labs over in physics. We're, we're, we have a lot of equipment there that nobody knows about. In fact, probably Dr. Gouge is better that he doesn't know about it. It's down in the earth. It's it's in this a lot of it's in this place called the Leach Science Center. It looks like a very demure building on the surface, like there's not much in there, but it goes deep into the ground. That's usually where they put physicists. They put us in the ground. Okay, they want us to be kind of away from the public view. Uh, you know, they had us years ago take the word nuclear off the Leach Science Center. This used to be called the Leach Nuclear Science Center. But when we had the Olympics in Atlanta, we were housing some teams from international countries down here. And they said, well, Homeland Security said, well, you know, we got any nuclear, get that thing off the building. You know, we don't want to attract any attention. So nuclear is off the building now, although we still do nuclear physics. What, these are our five areas, plasma physics, condensed matter physics, atomic physics education, space physics. This, these slides here are what typical plasma physics equipment looks like. Now that thing in the upper right hand corner, I don't know if you can see that very well. You don't buy that at Walmart, okay? You don't go to Walmart and say, give me, give me a magnetically confined fusion Pokemac Type system. We had to build that. We had teams of graduate students with ball peen hammers hammering wire onto this thing. And what I'm trying to uh, this part here is a donut. If you look from the from the from the ceiling down, this would look like a Cheerio or a donut. It's wrapped with wire. We put plasma in there. We basically use a microwave oven to ignite it. You ignite plasma like you ignite a uh, spark plug in your internal combustion engine car. The plasma looks like a fluorescent bulb. Kind of looks like this when you actually get it in there, but it's roughly one million degrees. That's pretty sobering because I can stand beside that. I should have put a person in there so you see what the size of this thing is. The size of it is about this section of the room. That's how big this, this thing is in the upper right hand corner. Miles of wire on it. But it gets up to rough, roughly 1 million degrees. Now, you say, well, what do you need that for? Well, we're trying to produce a star on planet Earth. 
There's physicists around the planet trying to say, look, the sun just sits there. It's not plugged into a gas tank. You know, the sun doesn't ask, okay, I'm filling me up with fuel. I mean, it just kind of merrily produces energy millions and millions of years. Wouldn't it be nice if we could develop a, basically a star on planet Earth? Then we would need one power plant to power up the whole Earth. Okay, so that's what this thing is sort of aiming to do. Now, what the sun does, it does at 20 million degrees, so we're only at 1 million here at Auburn, <laughs> so we've got a ways to go. But, and it's very high pressure in the center of the sun, but, but there are physicists, plasma physicists around the world trying to attack this problem. I get it, I'm not in this area, but I get a sense from talking to these guys who are still 50, 30 to 50 years away from doing this. But basically to harness the power of the sun on one power plant on planet Earth. Now they're building the biggest one on planet Earth right now in the south of France. It's called ITER, that's the acronym for it. Google that one when you get home. This thing's going to rise out of the vineyards of France, this huge building, with the biggest one of these that, that's possible to be made nowadays, and it's a multi-country type of a thing. And so there's a few of these around the country that do their smaller scale tokamak type uh, fusion devices that people do smaller scale experiments and we feed information to the big boys in this eater system or the Princeton one. Princeton's the biggest one in America right now. But that's what this stuff looks like. And you have to build that. That took two years to build that thing. Balking hammers, hammering in the wires. There, there wasn't any enough power in Auburn, Oklahoma to power this baby up. We have to make our own electrical power over there. Okay? So the way we do that, we bought two Amtrak locomotives. They have electrical engines that are generating power all the time for us. We put it in a room of capacitors, and then we dump it into this thing when we need it. So Alabama Power kind of mixed us being on the power grid. We told them we do it at 3 o'clock in the morning, they still mix this. All right, a few other things here you probably don't know we have. We have a small scale particle accelerator here at all. Probably you've never heard of this, never seen it. It's in the basement over there. It's down in the cave. But this is the back of the tank and what it looks like. So basically, if I were to, I guess I can use this pointer. The back here, that's out of this picture, there's where we would produce our particles, alpha particles, nuclear particles, electrons, and then we accelerate them forward this way, and then the front end of the line is like this. This is what you would see if you were over here back in the lab looking back at the bore of this thing. This is about the size of a basketball court, okay? And particles start back here, and by the time they reach here, they're going about seven-tenths the speed of light. Okay, now who remembers the speed of light value? Anybody remember, what's the speed of light? 186,300 miles per second. About seven times around the world in one second. Okay, that's, that's moving. That's the fastest possible thing. That's a question I get asked on those planes. Well, I think we ought to be able to break the speed of light. You know, that those warp engines on that Enterprise, they seem to be able to break the speed of light. What's the matter with you guys? So I have to explain the way you can't break the speed of light to the layperson a lot. But some other, some more of our equipment that we have here at Auburn. Now, let me give you two projects that we're working on. You say, okay, uh, this is some time in the sky. What do you actually do? Let me tell you about two of our projects. Now, CAVE, my global organization, has about 30 projects going on all the time. This is a very active research center. It combines engineers, physicists, other scientists around the campus. We support this center by 35 graduate students. So some of you guys here are tied into me. Jennifer, I first met, I, not through Kay, but because she needed some work done. So let me tell you about two projects that really get you involved here. One of the projects I worked on the first 10 years I was here was this thing called Extreme Environmental Electronics. Now here's the story. There's an F-16 fighter aircraft. There's the cockpit of an F-16 fighter aircraft. Now, if you got into that cockpit, I've actually been in that cockpit, all you're doing, you're sitting on top of a jet engine. That's all this thing is, is a, a cockpit seat on a hot jet engine, and you're surrounded by all these electronics. Okay? Now, here's the problem. Electronics, at least, Back, below, back before 10 years ago, could only take up to about the boiling point of water and they'd die forever. 
So if you put your cell phone into a, into your, while you're cooking cookies, and you turn that thing up to about 212 Fahrenheit, which is, you know, low for cookies, I think. I'm not a cook. But they'll die. Your electronics will never work again. It's because your electronics is made out of silicon. Silicon, if you get it up in temperature to about the boiling point of water, changes its properties in a way that will irreparably damage your electronics. It will turn a semiconductor into a conductor. That means all the transistors in your cell phone, your computer, will, will just freak out, will never work again. So what are the, the F-16s have been around for longer than 10 years. How do they handle this problem? All this heat generated from the jet engine coming up into the electronics, you don't want your plane falling out of the sky. So they did, well, okay, we gotta cool the electronics. How do we cool electronics in F-16? Well, you can heat sink things, meaning you attach big pieces of metal to the electronics. That's a problem because it adds weight to the plane. It's just dead weight, it's not doing anything except taking heat out of the electronics. Second thing they tried is, well, let's take the coolest part of the F-16, which believe it or not, is the jet fuel. The jet fuel is the coolest part of the plane. So let's say, well, look, let's just deal with this like radiator water in your car. Let's take that, that jet fuel and pass it as close as we can to all that electronics to get the heat out of the electronics. That was their solution in this F-16. Now, if I'm a pilot, do you want to know this? I mean, here I am, you know, driving this thing, and here it is, volatile jet fuel, a few inches from electricity. You know, I'm going, you know, I'm going to, there's going to be an explosion in the air here before I get over to my targets. So we went to the government, a few of us around the country, 10 years ago, and we said, look, maybe 15 years ago, and said, why don't you let us develop a new generation of electronics that works hot without cooling it at all? And so that was the impetus of this so-called uh, high wide band gap electronics, harsh environmental electronics. We have nowadays electronics that works merrily at very high temperatures, three, four, five hundred degrees C temperatures, even super hot. And it's working merrily, you don't have to cool it, but we had to start over basically. Everything that Intel did 25 years ago, we almost had to start over because we're building these on carbide materials and not silicon materials. And these carbide materials are really tough. If you know anything about carbide, you can go to Sears, buy a drill bit, and it says carbide tipped, very tough material that we can make it in single crystal form now, wafer form, and then we can put circuits on that. So this was a better solution than having the jet fuel cooling these F-16s at the time. Now, a totally different project here. And this one has to do with reliability. And this might have something to do with this Boeing Dreamliner thing. I don't know if you've read about that. They've grounded the new Boeing Dreamliner because the lithium-ion battery has been blowing up and shortened, short-circuiting. Might have a consideration here. This is a project called Whiskers. Now, you see this guy here. You know, you know who this guy here is, right? Oops. I'm going to go back to it. This guy, he, he's your graduate. He's your graduate dean. He let you into school, so you better pay attention here, because he was kind enough to let you into the graduate school. So I work with George Flowers on this, and my graduate student on this area this night. This is what I'm talking about. This is an electron micrograph of human hair. And this is, a mic this is a an accompanying whisker. Now what these whiskers are, I like them to metallic cancer. There's a growth of a tumor out of certain metals that grows in this whisker form. Nobody understands why they're growing, how to control them. There's an incubation period like a cancer tumor would have. All of a sudden the tumor will start growing in a person's body. They don't know why, what triggers that. We're not sure yet. We're closing in on it, what triggers the growth of this. But you can imagine what's going to happen. Any of you have ever taken an electronics course before. If that whisker starts growing out of the metals in your integrated circuits in your electronic device, it's going to touch something else eventually. And in the nano world, where everything is miniaturized now, and the metals are really close to one another, if if a metal line, for example, a conductor in one of your integrated circuits grows one of these, it'll eventually touch another line. It'll short it out, it's called. That's called a short circuit. And basically, you just killed your electronics. 
So this is an electronics killer. And if you don't think it's been a problem, let me go down a couple of slides and I'll show you. Well, here's, here's some other pictures of these whisker-like things. Here they are on connector pins. Here they are on some electromagnetic relays, those little small things you see here. These are, these are uh, terminal lugs with, that you connect to power. I was dealing with one of these before I came over here. And even these things can develop a whisker. So this is a whisker growing out of the side of one of these terminal lugs. Now, say, is this really a problem? Yeah. Here is a graph from just six years. And NASA has looked very carefully at what the failure mode was for all these different things. So there's satellites. There's power modules. There's nuclear power plants. There's aerospace. There's military aircraft, nuclear power plants, missiles, military, military. This gets the attention of the CIA when one of their satellites all of a sudden goes dark and they're not communicating with Earth anymore. So NASA, and as far as some other covert organizations that I probably shouldn't name out to kill me, have looked at the failure mode and look at it. It's all tin whiskers. So all of these satellites, millions of dollars of taxpayer money went down the drain because these things are no longer communicating with Earth. GPS satellites, all kinds of electronics are failing because of this. And so that's why this is a real contemporary reliability problem. And you can probably tell it deals with physics, it deals with chemistry, it deals with thin film science, vacuum technology, electrical engineering. It's got the whole bailiwick of problems in this in this thing. So Auburn is one of the people, your graduate school dean is one of the key people that's investigating this. And we're we're trying to figure out how we can prevent these, basically. That's the job. Stop these things from growing, stop this cancer tumor from growing, and uh, you know, we'll give you a you know few hundred thousand dollars to do that. It's cheap, by the way. <laughs> so if you consider how much just in that one six-year period, how much money we've lost as taxpayers and corporations. Okay. Here's my lab. I just thought, I'd, how do I attack these? I have this, I'm a surface physicist. What does that mean? It means I study the top five atom layers of a surface or an air mix. This is important. In fact, this is the newest branch of physics. It's only been around for about 25 years, and that's because this deals with the nano world. Here, here's my analogy for the fifth grade. You take a baby block, one inch on a side, and you measure the surface area of the six sides, and then you also measure the volume of the baby block. Okay? If you shrink that baby block down, I'll put it in a Xerox machine, shrink it down, shrink it down, shrink it down, shrink it down to nano dimensions here, which is what our integrated circuits are nowadays. The ratio of surface to volume skyrockets, becomes huge. So as you make matter smaller, 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 more of its surface and less of its inside the baby block. So that's where I come in. I'm a surface physicist. I study surfaces and materials, and just about everything in the nano world is a surface in some way. So I study the chemistry, the physics, the material science, etc. of surfaces. And these are some of the apparatus I use here. All of these are almost custom made. This is my own, this is sort of my one commercial instrument over here. But most of the rest of these things we have to build, we have to diagram out, invent, uh, do the lading for a lot of it, do the stainless steel materials, we have, you know, put everything together. We have to invent some of the electronics that runs these things. So uh, so that's the deal there. That's sort of the story of what a physicist, at least one, does. I'll give you a couple of examples of projects. Now, before I show you some pictures here, and then this will go real fast here, because I brought I brought with me a bunch of SEM pictures of stuff that you guys probably have never seen because you don't look at the nano world every day. I'm going to put them up here, and I'm going to see if you can guess what they are. So that's coming up here in just a second. I can run through that in five minutes. I did want to give you one philosophical thing here, and that has to do with what I call, you guys are going to be the, the leaders of the next world here. And we're all fortunate, we're all blessed people, those of us in graduate school. There's not many of us, really. If you look at the whole of America, 
take the number of graduate students in America, divide by the population, it's still a pretty small number. So all of us are lucky, we're blessed to be here, and all, a lot of us are going to go back to our mother country, do international students. Some of us are going to go back to America, where we are, and we're going to try to make a contribution in the world. So I'm still of the belief that all professionals need to offer society some pro bono work. Now, this is a long-established tradition in America. Let me give you an example. If you're smart enough and bright enough and, and fortunate enough to get through law school, you get your law degree. The lawyers used to have to donate. They didn't have to. They did. Get back this one day a month that they gave free legal help to the unfortunate in our society. Doctors were the same way. So you say, well, okay, I'm a physicist. What can I do? Can I volunteer to do physics problems for a struggling student or something? <laughs> no. Uh, there's a lot of, each of you can look at your own profession and say, what can I give back to society? Okay, so here's what I do. I feel really strongly about education. I feel really strongly that the education in our country is this going this way. There's a downward negative slope. What has happened? Why are we only for the technological leader in America? Is, you know, America is supposed to be the world's technological leader. Why are we only graduating maybe 10 physicists of a certain kind? A thousand total. That seems totally you know, anomalous here. We ought to be graduating more, more than any other country in the world. I mean, what, what's happened to our education? So I go out and do education. Now, I use my other degree in theology to do that. Partly, I speak at a lot of churches. I speak at a lot of schools. I go out in high schools and say, this is what I do. I mean, you know, and, and this is a great job, a great career. Uh, let, me, let me show you what we're kind of doing. But I, I just think everybody should look within themselves. Once you get that $100,000 or more job, once you get back to your home state or your mother country and say, I'm a blessed person, what can I get back now to society? What can I do for society? And again, I, I go out to soup kitchens sometimes and just serve food. I write papers. I wrote this book last year, well, a couple of years ago, for students. You know, to help students with that freshman bulge that they get, or that big speed bump called freshman physics. You know, and I ask to teach freshmen every year because I love to get, okay, let me take you from high school, and let me get you up now to the SEC. Let me get you into the big time. I want to help you do that. So I'm, I'm trying to do those things. You all, you know, owe it to your country, you owe it to your parents and your societies to, to think of what you can do with your life after you get that big paying job. Because you know, it's not just it's not the money you make, it's the satisfaction you get. So that's whatever my two cents sermon there is all about there. All right, now let me go through some photographs and then I'll I'll be done here, I think, on time. Let's see if you can if you can just yell out where I've got about fifteen of these. What do you think that is? Oh, this is an eggshell. Okay. How about that? <laughs> ah, the light bulb filament. You're right. That's what a light bulb filament looks like. You were blowing it up. How about that? Oh, this is this is going to be a problem for us starting about right now in Alabama. Pollen. This is what pollen looks like. You're breathing in thousands and thousands of those. And you can see why that's bothersome to you. They look like dog burners. You know, microscopic dog burners. <laughs> okay, how about that? Filamentary. Auburn University Stationery. That's paper. So when you're writing on good stationery, that's what you're writing on. Okay, you ever been to a dentist? Ah, that's the dentist drill. <laughs> it's terrible, though, but I actually got that from my dentist. They still use those things. They're, they're, they've got carbon <coughs> embedded into that thing. Uh, ugly thing, isn't it? Okay, here's my insect collection. The head of a common house slot. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful, that eye socket there? I 
mean, you know, you, after you look at some of these, you say, I'm never going to fly. I'm never going to swat a fly again. By the way, I have done that, where I've had a bug like this that I froze liquid nitrogen and put it there, and it's looking good. And then I swatted them and put it back. It's like, I mean, there are eye sockets all over. If you swat a fly, I mean, he's, he's a mess. So I, 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 I left those pictures of him, OK? Uh, that's the mouth of the fly. So let me go back here. See this little structure here? That's its mouth. Look at what that looks like. Did you ever think you guys have that kind of design on that? That's amazing. OK, here's my famous picture. This is a honeybee. And that's the eye socket of a honeybee. And you got all these filamentary hairs growing out of there. And I kind of asked some of these bug scientists, what's, what's all that about? What do you think of it? A fly is flying through the air. And if I can see me even in here. You see that light hitting that projector screen. I can see the dust particles in the air. Well, to a fly flying through the air, that's like flack in World War II, trying to knock down your bomber. So he's flying through all this flack. He better have some protection for that eye, for that delicate eye socket. OK, uh, this one, a Mediterranean fruit fly. Now, aren't you glad that nature has made these small? What if, what if you woke up and that was on the end of your bed that size? I mean, these insects are, I mean, they're nasty looking. And of course, this is what we think that baseball bat is. That's a mosquito. Now, here's what you guys do. Now, this is a little Mythbusters trick for you. When a, if you ever see a mosquito stinging you, like on your arm, don't swat the mosquito. Tighten up your arm real quick. What that does is the stinger, he can't pull the stinger out, and blood is pumped into the mosquito at very high velocity. The mosquito explodes. <laughs> Try that at home sometime. <laughs> OK, this, uh, don't ask me where I got this, but <laughs> a student gave me this. OK, uh, okay now this is another famous picture here. You guys ever seen anything like that? You guys know what a vinyl record is? Vinyl record. This I took out of the 1964 Diana Ross and the Supremes collection greatest hits. And that little section right there, that's where the stylus vibrated. And the vibration was of Diana Ross's voice and encoded into the vinyl. And then you put a stylus in there and you totally reverse the signal process. It feeds out a live speaker. That's where he, she was saying, you can't hurry up when we're old hits. That little section of the record. <laughs> so for what that's worth, there's Diana's voice encoded. Uh, Forever. Okay, that's strawberries. Standing on the strawberry. These are a little more serious picture. There's carbon nanotubes, collagen fibers, cell wall surface. The microscopy we have in my field today is just incredible. Uh, at the dislocation loop, it's called as a material science term, uh, gold nickel interface. And that's my end slide. That's my dog waking me up every day. Just thought I'd throw that in there. Okay, Jeff, thank you guys for having me. For having me.
he kind of let off the call saying, I need six postdocs, the best in the country I can get. So he talked to all these guys at his little conference, and they went back and said, well, I have a student about to graduate. I'm sure he would love to come and work for you for two years. So it was a word of mouth thing. You know, the way I got to Auburn was totally word of mouth. I mean, I got a call from Auburn in Silicon Valley saying, well, look, we just talked to, again, this PhD mentor. We called him because Auburn was looking for a service physicist. So what do you call him? Call a famous service physicist. He said, yeah, if this guy goes back with his work for me, he's out in Silicon Valley, and I don't think we can pry him away from all that dollars he's making out there. We can try. So that's, that's how that all developed was kind of word of mouth. And, my area was so hybrid anyway. Surface physics is, 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 is physics, chemistry, it's all, the, all of the above. And so I, I, didn't, I didn't cower back from going into a chemistry department, even though I was trained as a physicist. In fact, the chemist wanted a couple of his physics guys around because he wanted to have equipment built that was novel and new. And that's usually what physicists are better at than chemists, the building unique one-of-a-kind equipment, so it was a bunch of stuff like that. Thank you.